All right, so uh, welcome and thanks to everyone who's joining us to watch this interview and I hope you've had a chance to see the documentary as well. Um, I'm here with Patrick Salmon and Dr. Charles Silverstein who worked on the documentary Cured and I'm just gonna jump right in with some questions. Um, so I'm gonna start with Patrick. Um, I just was hoping you could talk a little bit about how this, this documentary came about and um, how you got involved with the project. Yeah, I came across this, uh, this uh, film idea about six years ago. I'd been familiar with the story, uh, reading some LGBTQ history books, but about six years ago, a good friend of mine, uh, Charles Francis, had uh, shared with me a treatment he'd written about the life of Frank Kameny, who's one of the, the main characters in the story. And, and one of the scenes in the treatment was about the 1972 discussion at the APA annual meeting in Dallas with Dr. Anonymous, the man in the mask, and reading the treatment, that scene jumped out at me and I thought, wow, this could really make an interesting documentary. And so I embarked on that point and seeing what else was out there and I realized there hadn't been a documentary done about this subject. And so at that point, uh, my production partner, Bennett Singer and I dived into the story that was in a, the spring of 2015. And we quickly, quickly realized that this was such an important story to tell, an important moment in LGBTQ history. And we thought we wanted to try and tell the story. And we were able to track down many of the people like Dr. Silverstein, who were so instrumental to getting the DSM changed. And so we're excited to be able to present this to audiences. Yeah, great. Um, and it's a it's really a, a fascinating documentary. I think the the combination of sort of looking at the the widespread movement and the collective advocacy and these um, sort of individual moments of, um, I think, real courage, um, at this, particularly at that time, um, is really compelling. And so I wanted to ask Dr. Silverstein, um, your presentation that they cover in the film to the APA nomenclature committee um, in the 70s was clearly a key moment sort of for the movement and for this effort overall. But I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what that was like for you personally, what that experience was like going into it. You mean going into the meeting? Yeah. Itself with the psychiatrist? Well, I have to back up a little bit because um, there was a committee that was assigned to do it. And in order to understand the committee, you have to understand the ideology of the day. The, um, the gay liberation movement looked at the psychiatrist as the enemy they were known as the oppressors. Um, that was a very popular term in those days. And uh, when we got the opportunity to um, make a presentation before the nomenclature committee, it presented the conflict for the Gay Activist Alliance uh, because they were doing, they were going to make the presentation, but they couldn't make the presentation because that would have been meant um, talking to the oppressors. And you weren't allowed to talk to the oppressors because if you did, the oppressors would get you to compromise and they would then co-opt the, uh, the movement. So in any event, there was a special committee that was formulated called the Ad Hoc Committee. It was not the Ad Hoc of anything. It was just the Ad Hoc Committee. <laughs> and it was composed of some members from GAA, and I was from GAA, and some members from the commu community. We met repeatedly um, uh, and decided on a strategy for going into the meeting. And part of that strategy was preparing a document of all the evidence that we were right and the psychiatrists were wrong. Then on, uh, I was assigned to um, make the presentation from the professional point of view. And someone else, Gino Leary, was assigned to make um, the presentation from um, the, the average person's point of view about discrimination uh, against gays and, and lesbians. Um, my presentation, was one that made fun of the psychiatrist and the whole field of psychiatry, and especially the, um, the diagnostic systems. 
because one of the things that I learned uh, in studying and preparing for this meeting is that psychiatric diagnostic systems, which really go all the way back to ancient China, um, are, are not medical diagnoses. They're social statements of the people in society who are feared. And those who are feared get put on the diagnostic list to change them, to make them what they, what psychiatrists thought of as normal, but actually make them conform. So that I always looked at, and I, I still look at diagnostic systems and the people who believe in them as social police getting people to conform to society's norms, not to cure anything at all. I wrote this, my uh, speech the night before the meeting. The meeting was on February 8th, 1973. The night before I wrote my speech uh, with my lover, William, um, lying in bed in our small apartment in New York City. And um, when I walked into the Psychiatric Institute where the meeting was, I walked in with absolute confidence and certain that not only were we right, but that we were going to win this battle. And never did I waver from that. That's amazing. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I think it's so, so great to have, have you here as, you know, as part of um, this interview and as part of the getting the documentary out there as well. Um, and I wanted to also ask Patrick what it was like getting um, stories like um, Dr. Silverstein's together and, you know, talking with people, going through the archival materials, um, what that what that process was like for you? Well, first of all, it was it was quite humbling to talk with people like Dr. Silverstein and and the other heroes in the story who really laid the groundwork for the world we live in today. And I know there's so much more work to do to make sure LGBTQ people are treated equally. But this event and moment was such an important change because as long as we were considered mentally ill, then business and government were going to use it as an excuse to discriminate. So it really laid the groundwork for everything that followed. But as we got started, we quickly realized, Ben and I quickly realized how time was of, was quite urgent. The first person we interviewed, Ron Gold, he's in the film. Unfortunately, he passed away about six months after we uh, interviewed him. And I know Dr. Silverstein knew, knew Ron well. And since then, uh, two other people have passed away. And so we, Ben and I felt a very, um, very much a responsibility to tell this story because we realized that this would be the only chance to tell the story in a documentary where you're hearing from the voices of the participants who were there. And some of the, some of the key people had already passed away like Barbara Giddings and Frank Kameny. And fortunately, we were able to find a lot of great archival material. And that's really the, the backbone of the film aside from the first person testimony from, from people like Dr. Silverstein and uh, the, we had a great archival research team, Rudu Chandra and Luann Jones, really found great material uh, from various sources. I think more than 75 archival uh, facilities are, are used as the basis for the different material you see. And then Bennett and I were fortunate to visit a lot of places in person because, as you know, not everything's online and nothing can replicate that idea of digging through boxes and looking for nuggets. And a couple of the, you know, the great nuggets that, that we found was Dr. Anonymous, the speech in 1972, we knew that it would, the handwritten notes were there, so we knew the words he said, but Bennett and I visited the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia for three days, and Dr. Fryer, after he passed away in 2003, 217 boxes of his material were there, and in a, there was actually a box labeled miscellaneous audio, and so we spent an afternoon digging through that. They gave us an old tape recorder and Bennett was going from one tape to the next and in an unlabeled tape, here was this amazing audio of, of Dr. Anonymous sharing his testimony as, a, as a, you know, a gay psychiatrist. And he had to be closeted because of course he would have been fired if, if he was known to, to be gay. So 
this search was so satisfying to turn up these little nuggets and there's uh, watching the film is, is satisfying for a lot of reasons, but knowing all of the sort of story behind each of those visual elements is really an incredible experience. And where possible, we've tried to juxtapose the, uh, our, our heroes from back then doing the work. Like we have Dr. Silverstein on 60 Minutes. We have Reverend Kennedy on the David Susskind show on PBS. So we're able to put the archival material from the past where we see the, the heroes at work and then we're able to have the recollections in, in the present day. So we're, we feel so fortunate to have gotten so many great voices. And we know the story is, you know, it's hard to tell us such a complicated story in a short amount of time. And we know there's so much more to the story and hopefully this will have people, you know, do more digging about it. There are some books out there. So hopefully we've done justice to this story. Yeah, I, I think, think I, I, I want to say, I think the archivists did a great job. They, they pulled up stuff I never saw before. We appreciate okay. that. Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 the wealth and the, the breadth of archival material, I think, in this um, documentary is, is really impressive and helps um, really make that impact. And then, as you say, the juxtaposition with, um, you know, people being able to tell the story firsthand, um, you know, and to keep in mind that, you know, this happened within living memory, right? Um, and I think it's, it's kind of um, tempting to think about progress is linear, right? Like things were bad and then there was a fight and now it's better. Um, but at the end of the documentary, you sort of bring it into this contemporary moment by talking about the ways in which um, the LGBTQ community is still sort of um, fighting for, for equality and for justice. And you, you mentioned specifically um, conversion therapy and um, the trans community. So I was wondering if um, maybe both of you could talk about how you see, um, you know, sort of things today being either um, different or similar to um, some of the, the themes and struggles that uh, were going on in the 70s. Dr. Silverstein, do you want to start or should I? I'd let, let's have you start. Sure. Well, I think one of the things is, you know, even though this is a story about the past, I think it has relevant lessons for the activism that's still going on today. And you see, uh, which Dr. Silverstein alluded to, this mix of insiders and outsiders, where you needed people coming to APA meetings and protesting and shouting down speakers and battling the psychiatrist. But you also needed people like Dr. Silverstein and his colleagues who could go meet with the decision makers because it's not enough to just throw rocks from the outside, which is important to get, you know, a, a PR and press and, and create momentum and energy uh, among the community. But ultimately you have to translate that anger, that activism into creating change and maneuvering with the decision makers. And you really need both elements. And we see that in social change movements throughout history. We see it in, the, in, in our own, in the LGBTQ community. That mix of insiders and outsiders, I think, is so essential. And it really can be a blueprint for the important work that still needs to be done today. Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I would look at it this way, that in all so social change, there is a kind of dance between radical and moderate organizations. And that if you're going to make a change in society, it will never happen with a moderate organization because they're the ones that are cooperating with, quote, the oppressors, and they never get anywhere. That it always starts with something radical, something that shakes the body po positive, gets a lot of publicity, causes a lot of trouble, and after that, moderate people and moderate groups get involved. And these two groups hate each other. But they're both necessary because without the radicals, the mo change cannot happen unless it becomes a, a revolution. And I don't mean the social revolution. So they're both necessary. When it comes to the trans community, um, things have gotten much better for them. Um, it, it may not be everything that they want. They can, they can now use public money for uh, surgery. 
the latest DSM um, has had to um, walk a fine line between calling them sick, but not too sick, because if they, if they don't get a, a diagnosis, then they can't get public money for surgery. So the argument was, how can we um, provide a, a diagnosis where the, they're not considered sick, but they can get the, um, the surgery? And so it went from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria, um, which the psychiatrist defined as not quite a symptom. A, a, a disease, and that's how they did it. And um, things much better for the trans community. Yeah, I think um, absolutely. If anything, um, this documentary really shows the ways in which kind of ongoing struggle um, leads to change over time, right? Um, and improvements, while while also still acknowledging that you know, the struggle, the struggle continues, that victories along the way are not the end of the, the fight, um, which I think is, is such an important message. Um, you've both mentioned a little bit about um, sort of the ways in which um, social and political forces worked with, um, worked with the, the APA. Um, and I'm thinking particularly in this, this sort of current historical moment that we're in with a, a global pandemic and an upcoming election and all of these things, um, the ways in which politics can influence um, supposedly, um, you know, scientific organizations. And I think you see that in the film, um, sometimes more or less explicitly. Um, but I was wondering if you could um, maybe both speak to either Patrick, some of the things that you saw when you were looking through the archives and doing the interviews, um, and Dr. Silverstein kind of living through it, the ways in which, you um, politics and science kind of um, intersect in these particular ways, um, especially in organizations like, like APA. Charles, maybe you could start on the specifics of, of this sort of mix of science and politics in the, in the DSM fight. Um, um, you cannot look at uh, DSM as uh, a Bible. It is a book that tells you about the social, moral, political, and economic concerns of society at a certain period of time. Um, when we were fighting against um, uh, the APA uh, and, and the uh, diagnostic manual, we specifically wanted to curtail the money that was being made by psychiatrists at the time. It was an explicit goal of ours. Um, you have to remember that the more diagnoses you have, the more sick people that you have. Uh, just as on one day in December 15, 1973, uh, millions of people were no longer sick when the APA um, got rid of uh, the diagnosis of homosexuality. Um, the politics is, is, is also important. Um, and the politics always rise, uh, rise sub rosa of the, um, based upon the theories that certain mental health people believe, the um, the research that they want to do, um, all research is funded, and uh, if you're too far away from the mean, you're unlikely to get money. Uh, there are um, uh, just as uh, we find today, Republican and Democratic parties, that there's a um, a certain voice you have to have certain ideology. It's, it's also true in the psychological, psychiatric field that you have to conform to the, um, 
the prevailing beliefs. This is very different than biology or physics or math, where you can actually prove something. But it, you know, in the whole field of mental health, we can't really prove anything. We can have theories, we can have support them, um, but we can't prove anything. Because the most difficult thing to examine is oneself. And the whole field of mental health is not very good at it. But um, yes, a lot of it has to do with um, uh, politics within the organizations and economics. You got to make a buck. <laughs> yeah, definitely um, an important an important driver behind behind most things is the the economics. Uh, Patrick. And even during this fight, I, we didn't have a chance to get into it in the, in, the, in the documentary. We didn't have time. There was this sort of compromise language that was put forward in 1973, where, to Dr. Silverstein's point, some of the psychiatrists who were, quote, treating gay and lesbian people didn't want to lose out on those patients. And so there was this compromise term that Dr. Robert Spitzer came up with initially called sexual orientation disturbance, which allowed for people who were troubled by their homosexuality to still seek treatment. And it sort of was not at all based in anything scientific, but it was sort of a political compromise, if you will. So I think, you know, even in, in, in throughout COVID, of course, there's a lot of scientific research coming forward, but the, the politics, of course, is, is almost, it overshadows all of it. So it's a really uh, um, intricate dance. Yeah, Patrick Patrick's right there. Um, it was um, a sexual orientation disturbance. And then in the next issue of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manuals, they just put an old wine in a new bottle and they called it egocentonic and egodystonic homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't until the fourth edition, DSM-4, that um, they got rid of homosexuality completely. Um, uh, 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 professional organizations operate at a snail's pace. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things though, uh, building on what Dr. Silverstein just said is that the gay liberation movement was wise enough to claim victory in 1973. So even though there was still this battle within psychiatry, what, what sort of language, final language will settle on, you declare victory because to the average gay or lesbian person, it's sort of, it was this elimination and this revolutionary change. And then the APA sort of took another 15 years to sort of clean up that compromise. But I was in digging into the story, I found it fascinating how it was the declaration of victory that was so critical. And that's how the press, press reported it. Yeah, absolutely. I think taking, um... You have, you have to take your wins when right. they come, right? Right. So they um, got 80% of what they want, and they declared we've got 100% of what we want. So yeah. it was an interesting... But it, uh, what I want to emphasize is the publicity uh, about that decision. It was a headline in the New York Times. It was headlined in virtually every newspaper in the country. It was on every radio and TV program of what had been done. And it meant a great deal to a lot of people who were in the closet um, to hear that they had no longer been labeled as sick. Now, some of them still couldn't come out, but it meant a great deal to them to know that they were no longer perverts, they were no longer thought of as immoral, Absolutely. Um, we're, we're about coming up on our time, but I just wanted to, um, you know, open it to any um, final thoughts that you had or, or messages for the, the audience about, um, about this film and, or the movement. 
Sure. Well, let me let's say a few things. Number one, I want to thank the independent television service, ITVS, which is funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. They put in a sizable chunk of the funding that allowed this film to be made. We also got a lot of generous support from individual donors and foundations. But without ITVS's support, this wouldn't have been made. And so that's why when we were excited, there'll be a nationwide broadcast on PBS on Independent Lens in October of 2021. And we'll be doing hopefully hundreds of virtual screenings over the next year with LGBTQ organizations and mental health organizations. And people can find more details about that at, at curedocumentary.com. Great. Um, I have nothing more to say. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thank you both so much for your time and for joining us um, and Quad S to, to share this incredible, incredible story. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Jessica. bye now. <laughs>